lectures by faculty, uh, core faculty in project narrative. Um, we have one coming up in April with information uh, about that will be forthcoming soon. Uh, our speaker will be uh, Frederick Aldama. Uh, and today, before I uh, formally introduce Karen, I wanna make a couple of other uh, announcements. Um, so next Tuesday, March 16th, and this is especially relevant to people at OSU, um, but Tuesday the 16th from nine to 11, the Office of International Affairs will be sponsoring an international research symposium focused on calling attention to and fostering connections between Ohio State and the University of Tampere in Finland. The symposium is part of a process that's ongoing to develop a formal memorandum of understanding uh, between the two universities, OSU and University of uh, Tampere. Um, the symposium will be hosted by two core faculty from Project Narrative, uh, Brian McHale and Robin Warhol. And it will include a joint presentation um, by me and Mari Hadavara of Tampere. Mari and I will talk about the collaborations between Project Narrative and a similar group at Tampere, which goes by the, under the name of Norare. Uh, Joey's going to put a link for more information um, in the chat. Um, and I just want to highlight that um, the Office of International Affairs requests that people uh, register for the symposium. So you can go to the a link and uh, you know go through the process of registration. So we'd like to have a good turnout. <laughs> and uh, if you could come even for just for a short time, uh, I'd be grateful. So thank you. Um, one other uh, OS, uh, Office of International Affairs um, matter that I want to call your attention to is that they are developing a new funding program to offer support for teaching, or more specifically in their language, to support the development of internationally focused learning and cultural exchanges at Ohio State using a variety of platforms and mediums. Right. Joy also put the link to more information uh, about that in the chat. Okay. All right. So now we're turned to um, today's event. Um, and it's really a pleasure for me to introduce my longtime colleague, Karen Winstead, whom I first met when she was a job candidate back in the day. I'm not going to talk about how many years. Um, and I was on the hiring committee. Uh, this was before Project Narrative was even uh, the germ of an idea. Um, when we hired Karen, I just thought we were getting a wonderful medievalist. Well, we certainly did get that as Karen effectively established herself as a pillar of our strength, OSU strength in medieval studies. Then once Project Narrative got going, Karen began, began to come to our events and to talk with core faculty about narratological matters. And one thing led to another and now Karen has joined that core group. And as a result of that, she's considerably expanded our range and has allowed us to make new connections within OSU and beyond. Uh, Karen's research has focused on gender, popular culture, and life writings, particularly Lives of the Saints. Uh, her books include Virgin Martyrs, Legends of Sainthood in Late Medieval England, and the first volume of the Oxford History of Life Writings. In today's talk, from Margaret the Dragon Slayer to Marjorie Kemp, narrating women's lives in 15th century England, Karen will share some of the findings and reflections from her recent book, 15th Century Lives, Writing Sainthood in England, which came out from the University of Notre Dame Press at the end of 2020. So please join me in welcoming Karen. Thank you. I am going to, if I can, share my screen um, yes right, absolutely whoops wait. all right just a second uh, wait 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 joy are you the host i think yeah, i've got yeah. it can okay, you see no, it yeah good right okay well thank you so much jim for that lovely introduction and thank you everybody for um being here um, now, as I am going to tell you a little bit about my scholarship and particularly about where I am now, I find that I can't, it takes me back 
to where I was when Jim met me. Um, and I had just written, or I was in the process of writing my first book. So what I'm going to do as I tell you about myself now and my scholarship now is I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use the lives that I'm talking about to tell you a little bit about my own life. And in that way, I will be replicating the authors that I will be talking about. I will be doing something distinctly medieval. I feel like with the publication of 15th century lives, I am just peeking out of the rabbit hole that I leapt into as a young graduate student in the 1980s, when I was researching my book, which eventually became Virgin Martyrs, published in, um, in 1997. Um, when I was a graduate student, I became obsessed with lives of the saints. Um, these are mostly the lives of people who never existed, but they were very, very popular. And there were certain kinds of stories that were told by the gajillion in pretty much the same way. So you have lives of hermits, you have lives of virgin martyrs and of um, transvestite saints and all kinds of different saints. And they ba basically form, followed the same formula. You would see the same plots, the same characters, the same incidents, et cetera, et cetera. Now in the 1980s, that made them very uninteresting to most people in literature departments. And indeed the common sense was that, you know, you've read one of these things and you've read them all. And so I was really kind of being a little transgressive when I decided that I was just obsessed with these things. I became particularly interested in Virgin Martyrs, um, the subject of my first book. And here you can see a life of the opening scene of a life of St. Margaret, who I will be focusing on particularly today. Now, Virgin Martyrs were among the most, um, uh, the most popular of saints in the Middle Ages. And their lives were followed pretty much the same formula. You would have a young virgin who was also a Christian, and she would be propositioned by a young man who was usually a figure of power. And she would say, no, she didn't want to be his mistress. She didn't want to be his wife because she was already betrothed to Christ. And as a result, he would haul her into court, torture her in various ways to make her change her mind. He would not succeed in doing it, and so he would kill her. Okay, so these lives were written by the dozens, by the hundreds. They are very formulaic, and the formula was the essence of what they were. For medieval saints' lives, regardless of the genre, formula was essential. The idea was that to establish somebody as a saint, as somebody worthy of veneration, they needed to, their lives needed to conform to a broader paradigm of sainthood that was ultimately based on the life of Christ. So you needed to have the same incidences, characters, events depicted over and over and over to show how your subject is part of that formula. And so it was with Virgin Martyrs. Um, now, my question was, why on earth were these stories so popular? And that just intrigued me, and I wanted to find out the answer to that. And I can do, and 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 again, I mean, I, I remember way back, um, nobody was studying these things. They were, you know, they weren't literature. They were just popular culture, and popular culture was not au courant in the 1980s, at least not in my world. And I can remember um, as I was working on my dissertation and puzzling over this problem, having lunch with um, Thomas Freeman, the Renaissance scholar, and Tom was asking me, you know, why are you interested in this stuff? And I said, well, because it's so repugnant. You have these stories about sexualized violence, and they're disgusting, and they're horrible. And I'm fascinated by them. And he looked at me, and he said, you have a strange mind. And I think that is one of the highest compliments I've ever gotten. And I hope I will always have a strange mind. Having a strange mind is a very good thing. 
So anyhow, as I went and I looked at these narratives, I found that the reason that they were so popular is because they were that within these formulas, you could make any kind of narrative. And this is something that, of course, narratologists really understand. But in the middle, but in medieval studies, there weren't all that many narratologists, and people didn't look at narrative that way. You know, you can tweak the same events and characters and um, incidents, and you could obtain entirely different kinds of stories with entirely different kinds of messages, depending on you know what incidents you privilege and what you put in the background, depending on how you develop your characters, what kind of characters you have doing these things. Um, you could add incidents, you could gloss over incidents, sometimes even take them out. You could add dialogue, focalization, you know, you get a different story depending on whose perspective you want to privilege. And so say you take a saint like Saint Barbara, a standard virgin martyr, her father, um, was rather jealous of her as fathers often are of their daughters. And he wanted to keep her away from the sight of men. And so he built a tower for her. And um, he went off on a business trip and, um, and she was examining the construction site and um, she got in a conversation with the construction workers who were set and she asked them, why are you only building, building this tower with two windows? How about building it with three? And they said, well, your father said to build it with two. And she says, well, I'm telling you build it with three. So they did it. And daddy came home and he was furious and he blew his stack and he got really upset at the construction workers. And they said, your daughter told us to do that. And he said, what's with you, daughter? And she said, three windows, the Trinity, three persons, one God. And he had a royal fit. He had her tortured, persecuted for being a, a Christian, ultimately killed. Okay. So here you have St. Barbara represented in three different ways. On the left, you can see an altarpiece that emphasizes her victimization, nudity, violence, vulnerability. In the middle panel, you see St. Barbara and she is remonstrating with her father. You get much more empowerment here. She is the one doing the talking. She is the one who is um, gesturing. She is confident. Um, she is defiant and he is glowering, but she has the upper hand. And here you can see the conflict here is playing out and the level of the dogs where the lap dog is um, attacking the greyhound who is the hunter and supposedly the chief dog. And then in the, at the right, you see St. Barbara who is represented as perhaps an ordinary person might be represented. She is in a, um, this is a 15th century painting and Barbara is in a 15th century interior sitting on a 15th century piece of furniture with all of the 15th century accoutrements. You would not know that she is St. Barbara. Nothing would indicate that, except if you look out that window, you can see her martyrdom is unfolding in the distance in front of the tower. So you have that put to the background. And writers of narrative te texts were doing the same way. They were producing different St. Barbara's depending on how they would tweak the narrative. And that's what I talked about in my original book. Um, and that's uh, that's what I became obsessed with, you know, how writers of these saints legends could do things with narrative form. Um, in the 15th century, there was tendency, a tendency to do, pull this kind of maneuver and make the saints much, much more um, relatable to ordinary people than they had been in earlier incarnations. Okay, so 
Oh, oh yes. And Saint Petronella, this is the set, this is the image of my um of my book. And this is my very fame favorite uh image of that represents what authors and artists were doing in the 15th century and taking these superheroes of past saints' lives and making them more file more in line with ordinary people. Here you have Saint Petronella who died for her faith, for her faith, but here you see her as she could be a, you know, good good house housekeeping, um, you know, parad paradigm. She is there with her book, with her utensils, with her um, with her cooking pot, with her broom. Um, there is nothing, it is entirely erased from this visual narrative of, it, of her life. Her torture, her death, her suffering, her transgressiveness is wholly erased. And that's what narratives can do. And that is why these you might think kind of unlikely narratives continued to have their power because they were constantly being remade in ways that you might not think. So for St. Margaret, so my subject today, Margaret, was very, very popular in the 15th century. And I'm going to just give you a summary of her legend um, as it was told in a very famous 14th century um, pictorial narrative. Um, in the Queen Mary Psalter, early 14th century. And here you have Margaret, she is um, plying her distaff and she is being um, approached by the man who would like to appropriate her depending on her status as either his concubine or as his wife. So she he propositions her, she says no, he hauls her into his court, he tortures her in various ways, he tries various kinds of tortures to persuade her. These tortures, as you can see, are heavy on the nudity. Um, she persists throughout. So you have these scenes of extreme violence that alternate with scenes in which she is asserting her confidence and her autonomy over the man who is torturing and trying to appropriate her as his wife. And scenes of her and her persecutor coming face to face are intercut with scenes of sexual violence of the sort that I just showed you. And I want to put these scenes of the encounter together so you can see the progression. Here you have Margaret, facing off at first with her persecutor. He, they are both got their fingers in the air. They are arguing. Um, they are arguing with equal confidence. Um, he can't convince her, so he has her hauled off to prison. And notice his hand has gone down a little, but she is equally gesturing against him. She is facing away, looking back, having the last word, and he is not looking happy. She continues to scold him on her next encounter with him. And notice how he has gone from this confident finger up to palm up, almost supplicant, whereas she is gesturing with the same authority. She continues to gesture and look at, he has his hands in his lap. Um, she is winning. He can't, can, and so in the prison cell, in her prison cell, she has an encounter with another kind of enemy, the dragon, who swallows her. She exits from its belly. The dragon turns into a pair of demons whom she beats up until they cry for mercy. Again, the triumph. The dragon can't triumph. The devil can't triumph. The prefect can't, can't triumph. All he can do is have her beheaded, which of course is playing right into her hands because she goes to heaven where she joins her heavenly bridegroom. Now, St. Margaret's story is very, very much like a whole lot of virgin martyr legends. And you can see one element of its appeal. It contains with in its plot and this particular iteration of the narrative includes 
both scenes that showcase her triumph, her assertiveness, her empowerment, and alongside those scenes, you have these scenes of sexualized violence. Um, and so you have a narrative, what I call kind of misogyno-feminist. You have these elements of just deep misogyny conjoined with these elements of feminism, empowerment, and this helps make this kind of narrative really compelling, really popular. And you can see this mode of narration beyond medieval saints' lives into the popular narratives of our own day. Game of Thrones, I think, is a stunning example of that, where you have the combination of deeply misogynistic representations of women, with representations of female leaders, females, transgressors, women who will not be put down. Those things going together, there is something for everybody. There is also another mo element of that narrative which connects both the modern popular culture piece and the medieval text, and that is that both are set in the deep past. So you can have these stories about profound misogyny and sexual violence, and you can say, oh, that's what they did in the past. That's not what we do now. That's not in our civilized present. Okay, so um, St. Margaret, very, very popular all the way through the Middle Ages. And women were able to identify with her. And she was represented in ways that made it easy for them to see their lives somehow connected with hers. Here you can see actual medieval women. And here you have St. Margaret in the back. She kind of looks the same, fashionably dressed. Um, except you can see she is, oops, sorry about that, on, her, on a dragon. So we know she's a saint and not an ordinary lay person. Here again, we see she could be, she's fashionably dressed in the style of the 15th century that um, produced this image. Um, she is a reader and yet she bears the signs that she is a virgin martyr and not just a well-to-do aristocratic woman by the cross here and also by the dragon that's be behind her discreetly. But you might imagine Margaret is somebody like you if you were the reader of this prayer book or if you were the consumer of this one. Margaret is made in ways that make her story easy to relate to in the 15th century. Particularly women in the 15th century related to St. Margaret as the patron saint of childbirth. Margaret, before she died, prayed to God that he would aid women whose toiled and labored in childbirth. And here you see at the end of a, um, visual, uh, a um, narrative sequence of the life of St. Mar Margaret, tells Margaret's story in a number of different images. We see at the end, a scene of Margaret's tomb and a birthing belt over that tomb. And then we have added to that, conjoined to the story of Margaret, the story of a woman who is giving birth to a healthy child. So we see that her story conjoined to Margaret's, the story of a mother conjoined to the story of a woman who died because she wanted to be a virgin. Really, really interesting conjunction of narratives there. Why did Margaret get to be the patron of childbirth? Well, it's because she 
In the most famous episode and most widely illustrated episode of her story, she was swallowed by a dragon and emerged whole from its belly. And so this was seen as a successful birth. And here you see on the right, your slide here, this is a medieval image of a cesarean. Um, the women almost never, I don't think ever survived this. Um, but Margaret comes out safely and here you can see this safe child anyhow. The mother, things didn't go so well for. And the metaphorical mother in the life of St. Margaret didn't do so well either. Margaret's safe exit from the belly of the dragon resulted in the death of the metaphorical mother. And I could never understand why St. Margaret was so popular with mothers. Okay, the kid is born alive, but what about you? I would not want this woman or her story anywhere near that me if I were giving birth. But medieval storytellers brought Margaret's story more in line in the 15th century with the stories of women, particularly mothers. And there has been fascinating scholarship about 15th century versions of Lives of St. Margaret that tweak the descriptions of Margaret's torture so that they more nearly resemble the kinds of violence that a birthing mother would experience. So vaginal tearing. Um, and here you can see, um, I don't have, of course, an image of that, but here you can see this guy going at her loin cloth as if, um, as if to penetrate below. And that is made explicit in certain images of Margaret, which would remind anybody of the process of giving birth and the kinds of pain that one would suffer in the process of giving birth. Actual women used St. Margaret as part of a way to tell their story. In 1441, um, Margaret Paston, who was the wife of a wealthy landowner, John Paston, she was a manager of their estate. Margaret and John were happily married and they had the kind of commuting marriage that many people did in the Middle Ages, where um, the woman would stay and manage the estates while the husband went off to London to pursue business and to engage in lawsuits and many different things. So you have this very much a division of labor in medieval, many medieval um, uh, gentry households and Margaret wrote a letter to John and she tells this wonderful little story. She tells John she needs a new gown. Her father said it was John's fault that he could only squeeze into one of her dresses. She's been out it. She can't have it. She can't hide it. Everybody who sees her knows. And she says, I pray you will wear the ring with the image of St. Margaret that I sent you for a remembrance until you come home. You have left me such a remembrance that I have to think of you during the day and at night when I want to sleep. So ordinary woman, John Paston using Margaret to tell the story of her pregnancy to her husband. Women were not the only ones who were using the lives of saints to tell their story. Osborne Buckingham, a friar in, who was writing in the 1430s, 1440s, um, composed his first Saint's life, the life of a friend at the request of one of his friends. And this is really a fascinating work. Osborne Bokenham writes a life of St. Margaret that's very much in the fashion of 15th century lives of virgin martyrs and that he made her very much as far as he could into the image of a decorous gentlewoman of the time. But what he did that was really cool is he attached to that life a prologue of hundreds of lines telling his 
story. He was an ordinary friar. He's not the kind of person that you would, who would write his own life. People didn't, ordinary people didn't write autobiographies in the Middle Ages, at least not usually. Certainly not somebody like Osborne Bokenham. And yet, he was using the prologue to tell a digressive, meandering story about himself. How he came to write the story of St. Margaret. How his friend importuned him to write this story and how he did his research and he traveled to St. Margaret's shrine in Italy and the adventures that befell him as he traveled to the shrine. And oh my gosh, he had bad weather and he was stuck at this bad hotel that served bad wine. And yet he get, got to get some tasty tidbits about Margaret's life from the locals. And he was lucky that he didn't have more misadventures because um, before he left, he visited the shrine of St. Margaret that housed a reliquary with her foot. And you could see her whole foot. You could see the foot with everything except the big toe and the heel. And you could see the flesh on the foot. And this was really cool and this protected him. And oh, he's, his pen is misbehaving and he's blotted the page with his ink. And oh, that sucks. And he's gonna have to start stop a while and then he'll start again. So you get the idea. You have the story of the saint prefaced by the story of the author, told in a lot of detail. I call this in my, um, in my volume on life writing, I call this a runaway prologue. It's one of the first instances of autobiography by somebody who you would consider an ordinary person using the vehicle of writing the life of a spectacular saint to tell his unspectacular story. Really kind of cool. Sort of the same way that I used the occasion of this talk and talking about the saints that you came to hear of to tell you about what brought me to Saints Lives and to give the little anecdote about having lunch with Tom Freeman and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Being garrulous, being off the point, being medieval. So Osborne Bokenham went on to tell the story of St. Margaret. And I think this, I wanna emphasize Balkan and using this story because I think we somehow have the idea that the lives of women saints were all women's stories and women were just, and only women related to them. And that is absolutely not true. As Osborne Bokenham writing the life of St. Margaret for his male friend illustrates these lives touched the lives of men as well as women in various very, very complex ways. Now I will move on to, to Marjorie Kemp, who is a contemporary of Osborne Bokenham. She inhabited the town not so far away from Bokenham's, uh, um, from uh, Bokenham's uh, hometown. She lived in Kings Lynn. And one of the major churches in Kings Lane was the Church of St. Margaret. Marjorie Kemp knew the story of Margaret. She knew it really, really well. Margaret was a little, Marjorie was a little bit different from say Osborne Bokenham and Margaret Paston and other people who used saints to tell their lives to tell their ordinary lives. Because Marjorie Kemp, an entrepreneur, wife, mother of 14, had bigger aspirations. She wanted to be a saint herself. She wanted to be venerated. She wanted to establish herself as God's special darling. And the way you did that was by establishing your connection to the lives of the well-established saints like St. Margaret. 
St. Margaret, who suffered and died. And one way, late medieval women who wanted, and, and men who wanted to obtain this reputation for sanctity, to tell their stories or have their stories told in ways that would establish them as saints. One way they did that is to establish how much they suffered. And that aligned them with the saints of old. St. Margaret, tortured, bloody mess. That wouldn't happen in 15th century Norfolk. So you have to wear a hair shirt and do various horrible things to your body. And that was a well-established way of establishing that you in the contemporary world were a great holy woman or man. You establish that connection and suffering was the big point of intersection. And that's the way the lives of holy people who lived in late medieval Europe were commonly told. Look at how much they suffered. They burned candles and let the hot wax drip all over them. They wore hair shirts until their body bleed, their bodies bled and got festering and disgusting and infected and smelly and gross and weren't they holy. And Marjorie Kemp said, no. And she told a different story. She wanted to be like St. Margaret, just as good. She represented herself as the bride of Christ, just like St. Margaret and all those other virgin martyrs. And yet Christ, her bridegroom, said explicitly, you don't have to be a martyr. You don't have to be a virgin. All you need is to want those things. So Marjorie Kemp modeled what I call virtual piety, virtual holiness, another way of being a holy woman. You just have to want to be tortured like St. Margaret, and you will have all the benefits that accrue to her. You just have to want to be a virgin. And it doesn't matter if you had 14 kids, you're as good as a virgin. You don't have to go on pilgrimages. Wanting to go on pilgrimages is enough. You don't have to give big donations and found monasteries. Wanting to is enough. And you go on and on and on and on. And this is virtual piety. A lot of people who have read the book of Marjorie Kemp are fond of saying she's self-serving, she's a coward. But look at what she's doing. She is democratizing sainthood by saying, you do not have to suffer. You don't have to do that to be close to God. And that was a bold, transgressive, courageous narrative move. In Marjorie Kemp's time, women and men were encouraged to imagine scenes and narratives that would play were playing out in the Bible. So imagine biblical events as if you were present, as one um, author wrote. And you see that mode of spirituality attested in many of the prayer books in, that uh, come down to us from the Middle Ages. So here you see, right here, you see the owner of this prayer book, the commissioner of this prayer book, and she is has had herself inscribed into the decorated initial. And she is watching um, the scene from one of the apocryphal books of the God. Gospel. And this, this is not, if, if you were thinking, where does that occur in the Bible? Um, it actually doesn't in the canonical Gospels, but it is a narrative that is very well known in the Middle Ages. It comes from the Gospel of Thomas, where um, Jesus, this Gospel portrays Jesus as something of a um, 
the child from hell and it tells about his childhood and whenever he gets in an argument with his little playmates, he either strikes them dead or does something to them. Like in this case, he turns them all into pigs. Um, and so here you have this scene, very well known narrative, and you have the person who is watching that scene and her, uh, her, and her arms are giving her reaction to that narrative. So here you have the narrative and you have the response, and it is so, so, so very medieval. Um, and in so many cases like this, you have a differential here between the narrative frame of the biblical story, right? And you have the viewer, the consumer of that narrative that is off to the side looking in, but you see very carefully compartmentalized, they are occupying different narrative space, different narrative um, um, uh, different narrative worlds. Marjorie Kemp does something really, really different in that in her book, she rewrites biblical narratives in what you could say are proto fan fictions. She doesn't simply observe well known biblical stories and replay them in her mind. She enters into the narrative space and she changes the narrative. So for example, she raises the Virgin Mary and makes sure that she always has clean white nappies and is well fed, et cetera, et cetera. When the time comes and Mary becomes older, you know um, the famous story where the angel Gabriel um, announces to the Virgin Mary that she will be the mother of Christ? Well, it doesn't happen in the book of Marjorie Kemp. In Marjorie Kemp's version, Marjorie announces that. They make the trip to Bethlehem. And Marjorie makes sure that the virgin and then later the child have enough to eat, place to shelter. Um, where is Joe? Joseph, the husband? I don't know. She, he is just taken out of the narrative. And so Marjorie creates this world. She participates in salvation history. She creates a community of women that she interacts with. Mary, Mary's cousin Elizabeth. Um, after the crucifixion, she makes sure that Mary eats. She is a friend. She creates friendships, entering a different narrative world. It's a different way of storytelling. It's really radical. It's really transgressive. It's really cool. Um, Marjorie Kemp's book survives in one well-read manuscript, but it was made into a set of extracts that were printed and reprinted in the 16th century. Um, and what's really cool about these, these, these extracts, modern readers have really disliked the way these extracts um, in this Reader's Digest condensed version of the Book of Marjorie Kemp have uh, tampered with her life. What they have done is they have taken out basically all of the um, individualizing detail in the Book of Marjorie Kemp, you know, the details about what happened to her, who she talked to, where she went, what she ate, um, who her friends were, what she did at any particular time. But they kept all of these dialogues between Marjorie Kemp and Christ, where Christ is saying, you know, you don't have to go on a pilgrimage, you don't have to suffer, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, you just have to do it in your imagination. And so the common view of these extracts is that they have gutted the narrative of the book of Marjorie Kemp. And my view of that is, no, actually they haven't. They have distilled the most radical elements of the book of Marjorie Kemp down into a few neat pages that readers could use to construct their own narrative, which might be more conservative than what Marjorie Kemp did, or more radical. They create a do-it-yourself kit 
for story making that the reader could fashion as they want by making the kind of imaginative moves that Marjorie Kemp made to narrate her story. This is a wonderfully transgressive work for the 15th and 16th century reader for whom it wouldn't really matter who Marjorie Kemp talked to or what the day-to-day -day life is of a woman in the 15th century. You know, that's all old hat to them. That's their lived experience. So these things that we in the 21st century say are wonderful bits of literary archeology span and we want more of them, that wouldn't have been radical, empowering, wonderful to a early modern reader as it is to us. But this book here, this do-it-yourself guide to sainthood, that would be. Now, I told you that um, with the publication of 15th Century Lives, where I talk a lot about about the lie about making lives in the 15th century and the lives of women, the lives of men. The lives of women were some of the most exciting narratives of the, of the, of the 15th century. So I do spend a lot of time on those, but I also talk about a lot of other developments in the 15th century. But I thought, you know, okay, I'm done with Saints' lives. Um, and I wanna move on to other things, but as I peek out of the rabbit hole, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to say, I can't get out of this. And that is because the story of St. Margaret that was used to narrate lives, that was narrated differently and used to narrate lives of women from Margaret Paston to Marjorie Kemp is still being used to narrate the stories of women today in all kinds of different genres. And I keep on running into it. Um, for example, the anchoress, Margaret Cadwallader. I love this book. It's a historical fiction about an anchoress in the 15th century who is reading the life of St. Margaret. That's a big part of it. So you have a 15th century reader reading, or 13th century reader reading a 13th century book. Um, really, really cool work. And at the same time that the author is constructing a St. Margaret um, is reconstructing this process of reading and imagining how a 13th century reader might have read St. Margaret. She is, of course, reconstructing, reconstituting the narrative of St. Margaret for a 21st century reader, which is really, really kind of an interesting narrative move. And then I think, you know, you have Bertha Harris. 1972, lover, major transgressive postmodern venture into lesbian feminist fiction. And the story of Margaret and other virgin martyrs and other old saints are being used to tell this story. It's part of our storytelling in the 20th and 21st centuries. Or I just got this book, it's Sarah Donay's The Guinevere's set in, well, I'm not sure exactly when it's set. It's a little coy about this, but it's a 20th century narrative I, um, set after the war. And it's telling the story of four girls who grew up in the wartime and interspersed within the story of four Guinevere's, four modern girls, are the stories of virgin martyrs, Margaret, and others. We still turn to those old stories to tell new stories. We use them, these old stories, to invent new forms. They appear as part of the building blocks of new kinds of narratives. And that's why, as I peek out of the rabbit hole I dove into in the 1980s, I'm really tempted to go back in there and see what kind of crazy and wonderful stuff I missed. So that's my talk. Thank you so much 
for being here and listening. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, we have we do have time for questions, and uh, so people, you can either um, put a question in the chat or use the raised hand function, and uh, we will continue the discussion. So, who wants to go first? Karen, maybe I'll let you just uh, you know call on people that uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat, and then okay. uh, that might be simpler. Okay. I might not be. I, I'm going to go to gallery so that I can see everybody. Um, yeah. But I might not see you, so um, by all means, you know, jump on in. If I if you if you raise your hand and I don't call on you or Jim doesn't see you, well, maybe just to get things started, um, I have a, several questions. But one that struck out uh, that, that struck me in particular was. This, um, a possible connection um, between Marjorie Kemp's idea of a virtual sainthood and a Christian, or maybe it's more specifically Catholic idea about sin, mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you can commit, so, so I'm thinking about a, a possible analogy or correspondence between uh, sainthood and uh, sinning and, you know, <laughs> going to heaven or going to hell, um, sort of in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So that um, in on the sin side, right, the idea of wanting to do something, you know, forbidden um, can be considered um, as having done it, right? You can, mm -hmm. you're, you're as guilty as if you actually did it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was just thinking about that, um, you know, sort of conceptual analogy and, and whether there's any connection or is this just, you know, is there something about what's happening in, and I don't know about the, the, his, the history of that, you know, sort of doctrine, but I'm just wondering whether there's something, whether you can talk about whether there's something, you know, conceptually going on in Christian thinking around this time in the 15th century or so that, that would make these two things be emerging at the same time or whatever, whatever other kind of connection there might be? Jim, that's such a wonderful, wonderful um, question. And I had not thought about um, the connection in that way, but it is so obvious when you mention it, because yes, absolutely. There was a very, very strong element in penitential literature um, of if you, are thinking of committing a sin, then you have as good as done it. And that idea was particularly prominent around the idea of virginity, which of course is really engaging Marjorie Kemp. That if you think about sex, then you have as good as done it. And so I think it's really kind of ironic that Marjorie Kemp is taking this, um, this, this trope, which was so often used to talk about sin, and was so often used to talk about sex, and taking it and using it and, and sort of turning it on its head to say that all these good things that you want to do, you're as good as done it anyhow. But I love that connection. And one other point I'll make with the, with the sin thing, the book of Marjorie Kemp begins with an unconfessed sin, the part that's about her story. So um, it begins where she um, where she she is married and she has given birth and she is dying, she thinks, and she calls the priest and um, she's going to con confess a sin. Um, but he was a little hasty with her, and so she's too scared to do it, and she's afraid she's going to be damned. And that is really a pivotal moment. So it actually begins with sin, exactly where you're taking us with the question. And the really cool thing is, from a narratological point of view, is that Marjorie Kemp does not tell us what that sin is. And yet, she says, she confesses that sin over and over and over and over again. Which, which is really good, cool in a couple of, uh, of, of senses. First, that she confesses it. And so somebody hears it, she narrates it, but we don't get to hear what she narrates. And, um, um, and the other thing is that from the point of view of the church, once you've 
confessed your sin and you've had you've received absolution, then that, that's it. It's wiped clean. And yet she is confessing it again and again and again. And this act of piety and subservience to her confessor is actually a form of defiance, which is really kind of cool. So she's doing really neat things with sin. But thank you so much for that for that comment. Lee. Okay. Thank you for that fascinating talk. The images were astonishing. So I'll be thinking about those for a long time as well. And I, I really appreciate this um, sort of serial reading of the scenes of testimonial agency that seem to have a possibility mm -hmm. of, uh, of um, at least two, two different outcomes, right? That you, but they always, the ones that you've shown all go to the martyrdom picture. Mm -hmm. Is, is there a, a, a discourse, either narrative or pictorial, in which the pleas um, uh, win and she's not taken off, she doesn't have to marry the guy or, or consent to um, any kind of sexual encounter, but she persuades. So like, is there, is this a scene of possible persuasion or is persuasion always mooted from the outset? In the conventional martyr legends, I don't know of any case where she, pers well, no, actually, in the life of St. Cecilia, she persuades her husband not to consummate their marriage and they go on to be Christian martyrs. So there actually is a strain of virgin martyr legends where you do have a persuasion of the, um, of the spouse that could be the persecutor and then they go on to, they go on to, to be martyred. Um, but martyrdom, I think, and then you have, um, sort of quasi virgin martyrs like uh, Winifred and the suitor strikes off her head, but the priest comes out and puts it back on and resurrects her and she goes on to be a nun and her suitor is, is, is killed. So you have some of those as well. The most common narrative ending is that um, she, she ends up being, being killed. I think when you take extract um, elements of the story though, you, have the potential to read the story without the martyrdom ending. So you have the possibility of reading Rogue. And I think that's a possibility that we have to, um, that we have to acknowledge was present in the Middle Ages a lot more than possibly here because so much narrative was read aloud and people did do wild and crazy things with texts. And unfortunately, we only have what's attested, you know, what's come down to us in written texts, in visual pictorial cycles, which are going to be, I think, a little bit more conservative. But you have, a, you have this possibility, this narrative possibility that we could never um, recover. But I think it's really important for us to realize that it could have existed. Karen, I have a question. This is Julia. Hi, Julia. Hi. Thank you very much for that terrific talk. I want to make first one brief comment. Uh, within life narrative studies, the notion of relational autobiography has been sort of re recently proclaimed as distinctly modern, right? Later mm -hmm. half of the 20th century on, there's even a German book by Anne Ruggemeyer making this claim formally. So I was really pleased and heartened to hear you characterize it as distinctly medieval mm -hmm. and to use your own case as a kind of exemplum of that. I think that is important for life narrative studies. And I also wondered, I don't know if I can get this into a question because it's almost more a conversation point, but I was very interested in hearing somehow in your talk, um, in the revisions of saints' lives which and representations, which clearly occur both, both visually and verbally, initially in Latin and then in vernacular with much more option, I, it seems to me, to introduce variants. Um, to what extent is it possible to say, well, the role of 
sort of supervisors, especially within the church, would be to form official versions that would attempt to repress some of these potentially radical and transgressive aspects of the narratives um, that are critical of gender inequity and gendered violence. And um, does that kind of containment become impossible as early as Marjorie Kemp's narrative? I mean, people talk a lot about Sor Juana, but that's already the end of the 16th century. So you suggest to me a sort of different way of thinking about um, official versus transgressive unofficial narratives and, and efforts to contain them and resistant reading practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there was, I, I think there's such a range of, um, of approaches to life writing. And um, I mean, you have the official, you have official versions that were constructed for official purposes, like set, like um, like uh, canonization procedures, whose um, whose formulas are are dictated by um, the use that they're going to be put to. But then you have so many different um, possibilities in terms of what's of what's narrated and how it's narrated. And you have so many different, um, so many different um, sensibilities on the part of the clergy. Um, you have a radical clergy that, that, that would see somebody like Marjorie Kemp as, a, 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 as empowering to them and who would be fully on board with what she's trying to do. And then you see profoundly conservative voices that might be trying to silence um, these more transgressive voices. And I think that you know we have in our in in the texts that have come down to us, either um, written or visu uh, visual, um, you see a very very complicated. Um, a very, very complicated uh, combination of those different positions by different authors and different ideologies. And in many cases, you see compromised positions. In many cases, you see a certain kind of radicalism. And sometimes you see texts that are at war with themselves. Um, and that's one of the things that makes them so, so very interesting. I think it's always an issue in talking about a period like the Middle Ages, where you had limited literacy, though, that there is, it is the case where hegemonic, hegemonic voices are going to be the loudest. Um, and those that are most, um, are most nearly in line with those in power are going to be the, the, the voices that survive and are the most, and, and are amplified and are the most strongly heard, but I think that we can see these other voices and they are present and we just need to look for them. And they're not that hard to find if we look for them. Right, I think uh, Gerard Thomas next. Yes, uh, thank you. This is absolutely wonderful. And I, I understand and share uh, your continued uh, deep interest, which is a polite way of saying obsessions, with with these sort of things that interested us uh, when we first started studying these things. And uh, my particular rabbit hole at the moment is um, the iconography of St. George and the dragon, mm -hmm. and the way in which the dragon came in as a later addition to that, and then became prevalent, especially in the 13th and 14th centuries throughout uh, Europe, um, well known in the case of England, but literally everywhere where there was uh, the crusading element um, and the struggle uh, with the Ottoman Turks. So thinking of that and how it, the dragon then gets interpolated onto this other saint, is the, is the story of the dragon and the symbolism of the dragon in this story of St. Margaret, is it original or was it a later addition to or and and how do you think if in, in any way that plays into a common um emergence of this dragon and what does the dragon represent um the dragon i think was not in the 
very first iteration of Margaret, but it was there close to the first iteration of St. Margaret. And there's a wonderful um, book by Julia Dreviza, I think it is, um, about St. Margaret. And um, if you will give me, or if, you, if you'll if um, you email me, I'll, if you don't know that book, I'll send it to you. But it's absolutely wonderful. And it does go into the, the development of the Margaret legend, the development in the East, the development in the West. And I don't think that there is any, um, uh, it's any coincidence that Margaret became so popular in the later Middle Ages because of the dragon, just as George did. And she was sort of a counterpart to, um, to George. She was a female St. George. And in many respects, her iconography is similar to the iconography of St. George. And I think that was a very, very close, um, very, very um, important part of her appeal. And of course, George is also a, um, a saint whose encounter with a dragon is sexualized in weird ways. I mean, as Samantha Riches has shown, you know, the, the dragon is often has a vulva. And so it's a female dragon that he is skewering. Um, and the narratives around St. George are just absolutely fascinating. So yeah, there, I think there's a very, very close connection between, between George and Margaret. Uh, Emily Cody, you want to? Oh, sure. Hi, Karen. I, just, I had a, just a general question. And like I said in my chat comment, I'm not a medievalist or, an, or an early modernist. So since I'm looking at things from the 19th century, um, I'm sorry if this is a, an obvious question, but um, why are you focusing on the 15th century specifically? I focus on the 15th century, and that's a great question, Emily. Um, I focus on the 15th century because that is where so much happens. And there are so many experimentations in the writing of English saints' lives, um, which have been my concern. And um, so, and you get a sort of, I would say a, a religious sensibility that is so interesting and in a lot of ways foreshadows sensibilities and conceptions of holiness that are associated with the Renaissance and not supposed to happen this early. You get this attention to an informed intellectualized faith. Um, you get an attention to um, readers and scholars and preachers and, a, an opening up of saints' lives and stories to ordinary people. And you get ordinary people latching on to these stories and making them their own. And to me, that's, that's a really, really cool and wonderful um, phenomenon that people have taken these stories and they've remade them and they have and they have put themselves into the stories in such, in such, I don't know, such, I think, moving and transgressive and innovative ways. So that's what really attracted me to the to the 15th century. Thank you. Uh, Rahel August, do you have a comment in the chat? Do you want to turn that into a question or ask Karen to address it? The other, oh, just let me say one more other thing to Emily is also, I've got to say that um, the part of um, me that studies the 15th century is, is the perverse part of me. Um, I studied virgin martyrs because nobody else was looking at them and everybody thought they were boring. And that was the same when I started out in the 15th century. Nobody was doing it. It wasn't worth studying. It was all junk. Um, and so, of course, being perverse, I had to look more carefully at it. And then I just got fascinated. But yes. Being perverse is an excellent reason. <laughs> um, thank you for um, for addressing me. I, can you hear me all right? I can. Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk, Karen. Um, I don't really have a question, but I was just, um, I edited a book where one of our um, writers he wrote on Saint Margaret and the Bokenham version and and she was basically arguing also that Bokenham used Saint Margaret's life for political purposes um, mm -hmm. thinking about um, also vernac the vernacular tongue 
-hmm. And um, I was just wondering, because you've talked a lot about um, ordinary people appropriating saints' lives. Um, what about other ways that maybe saints' lives were appropriated for? Could they be appropriated for political, political narratives, for example? Um, oh, absolutely. And I think part of the um, part of the reason that these lives became so innovative in the 15th century is um, it was a period, at least at the beginning of the 15th century, of strong censorship. Um, and I think saints' lives provided a way for people to push back against that. Um, views that had been orthodox were becoming hereticated, um, like reading the Bible in English, for example which it used to be possible for Orthodox people to debate and talk about, and all of a sudden it became a sign of heresy. Um, and so you can use the lives of these saints that, whose stories go back to the dawn of Christianity, and you could use them to promote some fairly politically radical ideas, like you have saints who are studying the Bible in their vernacular language. And you, can, and you can show parallels between the attitudes of the persecutors of saints and the attitudes of the persecutors of, um, of non-conforming Christians in the 15th century. Yeah, those parallels were loud and clear. And yet, because you were doing a saint's life whose story originated in the dawn of Christianity, if anybody tried to call it on you, you on it, it was just, well, this is the way Margaret's story goes. So I'm not doing anything transgressive. There is that element, that wonderful element of deniability. I'm just telling Margaret's story. When of course we all know Margaret's story can be told in a gajillion different ways. Thank you very much. By the way, um, there's a wonderful reliquary in the, the Metropolitan Cloisters connection, a reliquary case of a foot that contains um, St. Margaret's scenes. If you ever have the chance to see that, that's great. I would love to see that. Yeah. Yes, in the cloisters, you say. Exactly, yeah. I will absolutely have to see that. That's probably, I wonder if that, I wonder if that's this very foot that Bokenham saw, but of course, saints have many feet, right? Hi, Karen, this is Eric Johnson. I've got a question. I, actually, I didn't even know. Well, Eric, could you hold on for a second just because uh, Charles Alexander has been waiting? Oh, yeah, not a problem at all. Okay. Then you will go to Eric and then Brian. Okay, Charles. I think you're muted. Charles, you're muted. Okay, I'm so interested in what you have to say about the authorial position and the author both writing themselves into the story and in some sense justifying themselves. And I'm wondering if contemporary audiences were able to see those works in that way. Did they understand that? And if they did, are they beginning to read other things in that way for example, the authors of the Gospels and things, and, and see authorship in general as being maybe more tricky. <laughs> oh, I think for sure they had a real sense of authorship as being extremely tricky. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I have absolutely no doubt of it. And, you know, it's one of the, the frustrations of studying the Middle Ages is that you don't have the same kinds of evidence of readership that you have if you're studying the 20th century or the 19th century or the 18th century, you know, these, these other periods, they have, you have so much evidence of, of, of readership and yet you have these fascinating things like um, people, manuscripts of the life of St. Margaret and the, and the, and the saints persecutors faces are faced in, in these violent ways that have been studied and you have these you have, you have these these tantalizing um, these tantalizing traces of powerful and um, compelling readings that were happening yeah yeah thank you okay Eric Hi, Karen. I, I don't know if I actually have an intelligible question here. Um, it's been years since I've actually spent a whole lot of intensive time with Marjorie Kemp, but I've always loved that book going back to my undergraduate years. 
And I really like what you had to say about kind of virtual sanctity and virtual sainthood. But I'm wondering if you could uh, expand a little bit on how Marjorie may have balanced this idea of virtual sanctity with practical, physical, active sanctity. Because I, I agree with everything you were saying, but as you well know, she also engages in physical pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. But she would have had access to that popular genre of virtual pilgrimages where you sit down and read a manuscript and it takes you to Rome yeah. uh, and gives you the various stations with devotional activities you're supposed to do while reading through this thing. Mm -hmm. Another another thing, you know, dialogues and disputations were a genre that she would have had access to to some extent and we know that she engaged in all sorts of dialogues and disputations herself. Mm -hmm. So she's clearly doing this active pursuit and this physical pursuit of sanctity as well and I'm just wondering if uh, in your closer reading of this that and I've ever done, if you can see kind of a rhetorical approach that she's taking in her own mind about how that active uh, pursuit of sanctity goes along with or competes with or supplements the virtual sanctity is this, this deliberate thing. And where's the kind of the dividing line for her about what she can and cannot do or should and should not do physically versus virtually. That's a, that's a wonderful question, Eric, and, and, and I don't know that there is a, a dividing line. And I know there's a, there's a lot of, there's some controversy in Marjorie Kemp's scholarship of exactly what she did do. And there are people who read the book as more or less a, um, as, as a fiction created by a woman or by a man, because you don't have any independent um, documentation where you might expect it of things like her conversations with archbishops and bishops and monks and so on, where you have fairly complete registers. And where is Archbishop Arundel's conversation with Mar Marjorie Kemp? So did that happen? Or is this part of her virtual piety? Is the whole book, including the pilgrimages and all of the things that she says happened to her bodily, is that all what she would have liked to have done for Christ's sake? Did any of it happen? And you can't really say anything did because there is an independent confirmation of anything except that Marjorie Kemp was a member of the prestigious Guild of the Trinity. So she couldn't have been as freakish as she seems, but she portrays in her book these just amazing um, boundary crossings of the virtual world into the real world. So she reports doing things like she is walking, at, she happens upon a woman with her baby and she sees the baby and she imagines the baby Jesus. So she goes running at this woman and she grabs the child out of her hands and she starts weeping and fussing over it. And just imagine how weird that would be. So she didn't have these boundaries or she's going to a wedding and all of a sudden she imagines Mary and Joseph and what's going to happen and, and the whole sacred history plays out in her imagination and she starts bawling in the middle of this wedding and that's just not done you're not supposed to do that in the bodily world so I think you get a sense that um you know she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't respect boundaries between the spiritual and the um and the real world, even though she talks about some of the things she practices in body and some that she practices um, in her mind's eye. Thanks. Ryan. So Karen, I'm curious about how, um, how seriously or otherwise you take the characterization of Marjorie Kemp's practice as kind of proto fan fiction. Um, because the received wisdom about fan fiction is that it's, you know, dependent on mm, a technological breakthroughs, that you couldn't have fan fiction before you had, first of all, cheap uh, printing and reproduction and circulation of print manuscript. And then it gets a big boost with the internet. And then you can have fan fiction because we've got this technological medium that fan fiction is just potential up till the time when it becomes technologically realizable. So if, if, if you really, you know, if you really mean this about Mar uh, uh, Marjorie Kemp, then, then in a way you're opening up the possibility that we should be thinking about fan fiction in a sort of continuous historical sense that there's been fan fiction, um, you know, since at least the 15th century and that we just haven't been looking in the right place or we haven't been thinking about it correctly, that we've been too hung up on a kind of technological determinism. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And I think it's very common to, um, 
I mean, you can define, if you define fan fic fiction as a form that is dependent on technology, then of course you can say, you can exclude the Middle Ages. But I would see fan fiction as a form of narrative. Um, and in that way, it doesn't need the technology. And one of the things that frustr frustrates me as a medievalist who's deeply interested in narrative is that so many medieval forms are defined out of existence. Oh, you didn't have biography in the Middle Ages. You didn't have a stealth in the Middle Ages. You didn't have fan fiction in the Middle Ages. You didn't have this in the Middle Ages or that in the Middle Ages. You didn't have anything in the Middle Ages. And I suspect largely it's because to look at a lot of what people were doing in the Middle Ages means looking at some of this intensely religious literature that is not very appealing to a lot of 21st century people who are not particularly religious in the medieval sense of the term, even if they are profoundly religious. I mean, I'm not saying anything about faith, but I'm saying medieval faith seems very, very alien. And these texts are very, very difficult to um, to negotiate and they require patience and sometimes they require you to learn another language. And it is just so frustrating for me to hear so many people say, oh, they didn't have that in the Middle Ages. When they haven't actually read any medieval texts, they don't know anything about these medieval forms and yet they are perfectly willing to pontificate about what wasn't in a period that they have absolutely no knowledge of. So thank you for giving me a chance to rant, Brian. But yes, absolutely, if you want, if people who want to define fan fiction in a way that requires technology, yeah, you can say they didn't have technology, they didn't have fan fiction in the Middle Ages, but I don't do it. Great. Um, any more, uh, any other questions, comments? Gerard, do you want to come back in? You're, you're muted. Gerard, you need to unmute. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think I was specifically interested uh, in this issue with um, Marjorie and the, the connection with childbirth um, and what you see, if, if you see that as part of um, sort of a larger societal trend um, to encourage uh, women to re help with the repopulation of Europe in the wake of the, the Black Death. Um, because that's one of the things that has stood out to me is, is the effect of that in the latter half of the 14th century and um, entire regions being devastated uh, and there being this real need for a revival of cities or towns or founding of new towns or repopulating of regions. So is there any sort of that that you've come across in, as a trend in these stories? If you look at the lives of late medieval women like Marjorie Kemp who aspired to sainthood, um, you see them getting a fair amount of pushback, at least some of them getting pushback. And um, Diane Elliott has written about that in her book, Chaste Marriage, in just such a wonderful way. And um, she talked a little bit about, or she talked a lot about how the clergy was was um, was discouraging those kinds of uh, pious practices on the part of the laity, and the way she put it, and I think this is one of the world one of scholarship's greatest sentences, that in order to have a celibate elite, you need a copulating laity. Um, and I'm, that's not exactly what you're um, what you're asking for, and I don't really have a good answer for the question you asked. But I know that the decision that the decision of people like Marjorie Kemp to remain chaste was often politically fraught for a lot of reasons. And I think, and I and I think, although I can't speak authoritatively to it, for the reasons that you're that that you're mentioning too. And 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 thank you for bringing that up. Okay, great. Well, we're just about out of time, so. Um... I don't see any other hands or anything uh, else in the chat. Um, so why don't we take this time to applaud Karen and thank her so much for this wonderful session. And thank you all for coming again. And 
I'm really delighted with the way this all works. So thanks and again, thank Karen. Thank you so much, Jim, for having me. And thank you for everybody to coming for coming. Um, and asking all these great questions. Karen, you mentioned uh, emailing you for um, that book title. Do you want me to just put that Quick in the- Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, that would be great. 